Wendy, there's a lot of trends. There's a lot of buzzwords. There's a lot of things going on in our industry and out there, the dating world and that sort of thing. And I'm just wondering to kind of kick things off, if you can share with us something that you might like to share with the ladies out there about the current dating landscape. Yeah, sure. Let me tell you the thing that is currently driving me the most nuts. You ready? So <laughs> the thing that's driving me nuts right now is the terms that we're throwing around in our industry, in the dating industry, which is terms like emotionally unavailable men and attachment avoidant men. That's the newest term. I mean, it might not be a new term, but it's the one that's being bandied about out there. Mm -hmm. Attachment avoidant. And, and I just want to say that this is a updated modern day word that just creates nothing but scarcity for you. That causes you to panic and fear that 98% of the men out there who are single are attachment avoidant and emotionally unavailable and all the things. And it's just not true. It's just not true. So there is a kernel of truth in that, and I'll break down what that is. But I want to also share what I think is really going on because we women have everything to do about the results that we get. And you might want to look at how you're presenting so you could get a different result. So you can be empowered. That sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> So good. Thank you. So the kernel of truth in this emotionally unavailable, avoidant attachment dude <laughs> is the kernel of truth here is I want you to think about the world in two pots, right? So the first pot is the relationship pot, people in relationships. And then there's the dating pot, right? There's the dating pool and the relationship people. The people in relationships, the men in relationships let's say 80, 85 of them want to commit. We'll just say that mm, 15, 20% are avoidant attachment and they're driving some wonderful woman insane right now, right? <laughs> Within their relationship. So the majority of men in partnership are not avoidant. You with me? Yep. Woohoo. <laughs> uh, so good. So the kernel of truth is there are going to be more men who are single who are going to be avoiding an attachment Hi, they're single. They're doing a great job, right? But it's not 95% or 90 or even 80. It might be closer to 40 or 30, maybe even less. But we keep having these experiences with men. And then based on the experience that we have, we will slap the label on emotionally unavailable or attachment avoidant. When really, if you knew what was really happening, uh, it's, not what, it's not what's happening here. He's not avoiding. He's just not, he's just stepping back from you. So why would that happen? <laughs> why would that happen? Why would that happen? And by the way, this is nothing I've ever done before. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> what I'm about to share with you, I did way more than once. So we're not alone here, sister. So, <laughs> so one of the things that we'll do is early on in dating, we'll get really excited about somebody anywhere from a first date to the first few dates, and we'll start sharing our hopes, dreams, values, and life goals. Like, I'm only dating because I'm looking for my partner and I don't want to waste my time with anybody. I'm not dating for sport or for fun. I'm dating for a relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm only dating for marriage. Or I'm 38 and I'd really like a child yesterday. So we'll share our dating purpose up front and that creates a huge amount of pressure for a stranger to have to take on this accountability of your hopes and dreams when he doesn't know enough about you yet. Right. Right. So you on the third date start talking about your hopes, dreams, desires, and that, and you're looking at him smiling going, you're really amazing. Whether you mean to or not, because who men are, are by nature, like a knee-jerk reaction, they're providers, protector types. So you start speaking your dreams, and he's listening through the filter of, I want to provide for her. And if you're a total stranger, it can be too much. It can be too overwhelming. And so instead of saying to you, wait a minute, 
naturally I'm a provider and I want to provide for you, but you're a stranger. I don't know you well enough yet. Let's start dating longer to see if it, no, they don't do that. They just go, ah, (laughs) there's too much, right? Too much too soon. So we can accidentally push them away just by expressing that desire to be married or to have a child or to be in partnership now. And also because it gives them a feeling that they're a wallet or a, a dad, a baby maker, right? They're, they will feel like they're undervalued for their whole self and that you're only looking at them as a package, that you're objectifying them, mm-hmm. right? So there's that piece to it where they'll back off if we're coming on too strong. And we don't even know we're coming on too strong because all we're talking about is our hope, dream, hope, dream, and desire for our future. So I just wanted to say that. So I want you to be careful before you label a man emotionally unavailable or avoidant attachment. What have you been talking about with him? And are you putting the cart before the horse on this one? And um, another thing to do instead, instead of think, is this one avoidant? Instead of doing that and focusing on that and calling that in because you're focusing on that, (laughs) instead of focusing on emotional unavailability and avoidant, just date people. Just date men or women or whoever you're dating, right? Just date people. And as you get to know them and you're slowly rolling out who you are and what you're about and what your hopes, dreams, and desires are eventually, you just keep looking to see, here are the things I need. Are they interested in what I need? Do they want to provide for what I need? Are they coming at me or are they backing off? Mm -hmm. That's it. That's Mm -hmm. all there is. And you and I have talked about some of this before, Wendy, or at least pieces of this. And one thing that we know is that a good man, a man that's, when I say good, I mean a man that's good in terms of wanting similar things to what you want, or at least open to that. Um, He takes a lot of, he takes the responsibility of providing for you really seriously. So he takes into account when you're speaking those things, you know, can I provide the, what she would expect as a boyfriend or as a husband or whatever. He's taking that seriously. And so that's part of the reason why it might feel like he's kind of behind where you might be in terms of putting those, those next steps out there. And I think often women misinterpret that as being, he's, he doesn't want to commit or he's not He's a non-committal or not emotionally available. I think that's at least a sliver of what we're talking about here. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Would you you agree with that? Yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Hundred percent. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because I think for a man, um, he's you're you're thinking you're expressing your hopes and dreams, but he's hearing it as this is now going to be my responsibility. This is now going to be my job, right? And like you said, if he doesn't even know you, he's not ready to take that job yet. Yeah, and there's certain things that we do that men don't do, and and I'm generalizing like crazy here, so if this doesn't, if this shoe doesn't fit for you, don't try and cram it on, but (laughs) that we women often will say yes to somebody not knowing who he fully is, And we figure if there are things that we don't like about him, we'll just figure out how to change him. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And guys don't do that. And that's why they take longer to commit is because they're looking at the whole package and they are really looking to see, can I provide for her and her hopes and dreams? And can I deal with every way that she is as as I'm starting to see who all of the dimensions of her, right? Can I really deal with her because they're not going to try and change you? Right. Yeah. yeah, whereas we sometimes think they're going to be our big fixer of her project. A project! Yeah. Yeah, so I completely agree with everything you've said, but I want to play devil's advocate for a second here, Wendy, because I know there's also advice going on out there that I've heard where people are saying, well, you've got to be authentic and you've got to say what you want right from the beginning and put it all out there. And then if that scares them off, then they're the wrong guy. You know, you've heard this too, right? I have. And in fact, one of my very favorite people in the whole world uh, actually tells women about this. And I went to her and girlfriend to girlfriend, I said, you can't keep telling people (laughs) that. 
<laughs> it works for you. By the way, that's a ship horn. Sorry about that. I live right on the water. <laughs> um, so uh, I said, you can't keep telling people that. I said, when, when it worked for you, you're telling people that it worked for you. When it worked for you, your now husband, who was sitting across from you, when you were rolling out your big future, was already in love with you. Right. Right? So for us really lucky people who got to, who get to use the apps and the online and the, right, the matches and the OkCupids and the Tinders and the Bumbles, for those of us lucky women who get to use those sites, those guys don't know you. They're not in love with you. You roll that stuff out on a first date. He's gone. Mm-hmm. Gone. And trust me, I took my friend's advice and I watched like a science experiment, blow up after blow up after blow up for that exact reason, rolling that out on the first date. And I didn't want children. I didn't even need marriage. I mean, I am married now, but I didn't need that. I just, right. need, I just needed partnership. So from my vantage point, I thought I had like a, an edge on my sister's who right around my age were looking for marriage and children. And I was like the easy one. <laughs> I'm easy. You, you totally can commit to me because I, I hardly need anything at all. I'm very little trouble. And when you roll all that out there, it's just, it's too much for, it's just too much. It's too much mm-hmm. for accountability. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think this doesn't mean you're not authentic or you're not real. I think that just looks a little different than what we're talking about. Being authentic and real doesn't necessarily just putting all those. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, would it be inauthentic of me not to share with you the details of my sex life? No, that wouldn't be inauthentic that I didn't share that with your audience. That, that would be prudent to not share that with your audience. Just like Mm -hmm. it would be prudent to not talk about, a prenuptial on a first date. Right. right. It would be prudent to probably not talk about sex on a first date. Right. I want to have sex with you. So it's also prudent to not roll out your hopes, dreams, and desires with your long game in mind because it is like talking about a prenup on a first date. It's too soon. And you can be a hundred percent authentic in you and share who are you and what do you care about and what do you love about your life and what are you up to and what are you doing next summer. And like, there's all that authenticity that you could just talk to him like a person instead of a future wife. Yeah. Future. Yeah. So this may take us a little bit off track, but since I have your wisdom here, Wendy, I Mm want to ask your opinion on something else that's maybe a little bit out there in, in terms of where we're going here, but I want to ask you if it's okay. I also feel like this ter- term that is thrown around so often, and in some cases is real, but I think it's overused, is the term of narcissist. That's another thing we hear about so much is how many narcissistic men. I mean, I feel like I read that, hear that, talk to people about that every day, and I'm thinking, yes, there are narcissistic people in the world, but really, are there this many narcissistic men out there and I, I'm wondering what your opinion is on this one too. I just feel like you and I just know so many clinical psychologists that have <laughs> to diagnose all of these narcissistic men. Right. Uh, drives me nuts. Drives me nuts. No. No. <laughs> and I don't even know where it comes from and it's everywhere other than yeah there are some men who talk about themselves incessantly yes or there are some men who uh appear to not care about anyone but themselves yes yeah speaking of this what you're talking about here i can remember years ago i didn't go on quite 121 first dates but i went on a lot being single until i was 43 and um I can remember one man I went out with, and Wendy, the whole time we were out, he talked incessantly about himself, did not ask a question about me. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking a lot of people would have labeled him as a narcissist in this day and age with that being thrown around all of the time. And and then interestingly enough, you know, I, I thought he was fine. I just thought it was interesting that he didn't ask me one single thing about me, and I didn't think he was interested in me. But he asked me out again, and when we got out on our second date, he just said, he said, I was so nervous 
that he said, I just rattled on and on and I was trying to impress you. And he said, I'm sure I didn't impress you. And I've thought about it ever since. And I'm really sorry. And he turned out to be this really, really nice guy. But if I had judged just on that one date in this climate right now, I probably would have said he's a narcissistic man. Yeah, you nailed it. You know, you could have not, you could have left off the part about that, what he said on the second date. You just could have told me that you went on that one date and ended it. And I would have told you there's two things that might've been going on and, and you told me the two things. You nailed it. And this is why incessant talking on a first date should be more like a, like a little pink post-it note that you make a note to yourself and check back the next date, but it's not a red flag. It's not a red flag. Mm-hmm. The pink post-it note. Let's check back. Let's. Other than the fact that he talked the whole time and that was really annoying that he didn't ask me anything about me, all of the things he said were pretty interesting. If he were like a normal person and we could have a two-way conversation, would I like him? Yeah, I think I would. Okay, so pink post-it note. I will note to myself to see if he talks as much next time. But let's give him another go mm-hmm. because because of that thing. There's three different things happening. One, he's nervous because you're amazing, which means you're going to turn somebody down because he likes you too much. (laughs) I promise once he gets to know you, he won't be nervous around you. So that goes away and it would be a crime to turn down someone for liking you too much. Not a good reason. So the second, so nervousness, second thing is what naturally happens between a man and a woman when they like each other is he tries to impress you, you try and attract him. So all he was doing was his biological, knee-jerk, animalistic instinct response was to be nervous chattering, and what was coming out was impress, 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 impress. You know those guys who are trying to impress you and you're not impressed, you are not easily impressed, he has to try harder than that. No, they're actually doing their biological job, trying to impress you, just like you try to attract him. You stand in front of your closet trying to figure out what to wear and how to make your hair shinier and prettier and how you're going to wear your face and all the things. That's what we do. He's trying to impress you. That's what they do. So they do that because it's natural and instinctual and their animal does it. But they also do it because they want to see, I have to be able to impress her because if I can't impress her, I'm never going to make her happy. And men only partner and marry women they can make happy. So part of it is animal, part of it is human spirit and part of it is animal. So he goes out on a date with you and his animal side is trying to impress because that's what they do, like a knee-jerk response. And then spirit is looking, can I impress her? Is this working? Can I make her happy? So in, in conjunction, right? So he's chattering away. He's impressing like he's supposed to because that's what nature does. And... He's not asking you anything. There's two things I want to say about that. One is they assume if you have something to say, you will jump in, even if you have to interrupt, because that's what they would do. And if you sit there silently because you're graceful and polite, he'll keep talking if he's unconscious like that and nervous. Mm -hmm. And so then, bam, label narcissist, right? The other thing that happens, and this might just blow your mind, (laughs) is he isn't, Michelle, he didn't ask you anything about you because he was already a yes to you. When chemistry is so high and they like us so much, they're done. All their job to do now is to win you over by impressing you and chatting incessantly. Um, And they're not asking you questions, not out of a disrespect. They're not asking you questions because they're already a yes to you. So he already has decided in his brain who you are. Now that's not lovely. That's kind of objectification, right? But, But chemistry masks this whole thing. Like Really heavy chemistry will have him think, I already know her, I already want her, I want her to be mine. And all curiosity is killed off by chemistry. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah. it's actually, I don't want to say a good sign. <laughs> it's a flattering sign. It's not a good sign. It's, it's objectification at its bones. But it's flattering that he wants that, thinks he knows me. But that's, that's why that happens. And yeah, it's misunderstood labeling all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, I, I'm really glad you're bringing this topic to the forefront because I do think these labels are slapped on too fast, too soon, too often on all of these men out there, on so many men out there. And um, I think the things we're talking about here are really important for women to understand. So another question, and this goes in a slightly different direction, is a another thing we hear frequently is the women, they say they don't want to settle, they don't want to lower their standards, and and of course, you and I are not out there telling people to settle. We're not out there saying, yes, be with someone that you're not attracted to at all. <laughs> we waited. <laughs> exactly, we waited. But, but what do you think about this whole standards thing, this whole standards thing? Because I also think this is a trap some women get into where they have, I don't even know if we'd call them standards, but they have criteria that would be next to impossible for any mortal man to ever meet. <laughs> yeah. And you want to be real with yourself and how willing are you to wait and for how long? And I knew in my four page list, single space, 12 point font, four pages, <laughs> I knew I was asking for a lot, a lot. And I got it. And it took me 121 first dates and a decade. Are you willing to keep a four page list if that's what it's going to cost you? And there were particular criteria on my list that conflicted with each other that made it even harder, right? So if you have on your list must be six feet tall and must um, give me one earn over $75,000 a year, six feet tall and how much he makes, those two items don't conflict. They're unrelated to each other. But there might be things on your list that do conflict, and I, I'll give you mine so you can just see it. One of the things that I absolutely had to have was someone who could make me feel safe, and I'm already a big woman. So he had to be bigger than me, stronger than me, stronger willed than me. He just had to be a bigger presence and also make me feel safe in the world and make me feel emotionally safe, right? A lot of women like that one. Mm -hmm. So it's already a tall order because I'm big and loud. I'm already big. I'm a big, like I'm a big presence in the world, right? So now he's got to be a bigger version. And I live in San Francisco, the land of the five foot seven. So <laughs> the land of the five foot seven. The five foot seven man, yes. Got it. So, you know, I'm looking for this needle in a haystack just with, just with safe, right? So I'm looking for safe and safe is hard for me to find in a town where everybody's nerdy and intellectual and not in their physical physicality. If I went to Texas, it could be a different deal, but I'm in San Francisco. So safe. Now the other thing on my list, after being single for a really long time and being in a long-term marriage before that where I was the boss, what I needed in a partner was I needed a lot of freedom and autonomy. Those two things conflict. The guy who can give you freedom and autonomy is not going to make you feel safe. He's going to be all even Steven, equal life, partner, we're going to do it together, go fly off to Africa and do a, a three-week save the people deal, go ahead, but he's not going to make you feel safe. And then the guy, the big strong guy who does make you feel safe isn't going to let you fly off to after Africa for three weeks because he's going to be worried about your safety. Mm -hmm. And so your freedom is now hampered. So those two things literally conflict. Are you willing to wait it out and find the 0.5% of men who can make you feel that way? Or would you rather not be so picky and pick one? Okay, well, freedom is more important than safety. I need to go to Africa for three weeks, so I'll figure out how 
he can make me safe in other ways. Maybe he's not, maybe he's going to be five foot seven, but I'm going to look for things in this guy that will give me a sense of safety. I'll create my own structure of safety with this guy. So how creative can you be about it? Right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think this comes down to also really knowing what your absolute have to have list would be your absolute things you absolutely have to have versus the nice to haves because I think so many women would whether they have it on paper or whether it's just in their minds would have a very long list um, of nice to haves Mm -hmm. those are not necessarily all need to haves in fact many of them are not and so I think it's important to be clear about what is really most important to you works with your values, works with your lifestyle, works with your overall life goals, and what those things are that you most need. And how you can tell the difference between what you have to have and what would be nice to have is by answering the question, would I rather be alone than be with blank? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I certainly would have loved six foot five, Am I going to, would I rather be alone than not with six foot five? No. Hmm. But what is that number? Would I, would I rather be alone than be with three foot five? Yes. Yeah. (laughs) So that's kind of where you can start to set the bar for yourself. And your friends may say you're setting the bar too high and you can thank them for their authenticity and then go about your business. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Wendy, I want to ask you another question, which is a little bit, again, not related to this, but again, since I have you and can tap into your wisdom, since you did go on these 121 first dates, if you were to just share, and I know you share some things in your book and in previous events and things like that, but if you were to share two or three things that you learned two or three big things that you feel like you learned from this experience that you think would be valuable to the women out there about dating, yeah. whatever, what would they be? Well, I'm one of, spot, one but of, I know you can handle it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I, I love, I love an exciting new question. Um, one of the things that I learned was that there are a, a very small percentage of men, maybe 20% or less that, if I really, really, really liked them, but I wasn't attracted to them, that they could flip me. So I had the experience of giving a guy a chance that I was so excited about him before we met. I mean, on paper, on, on the profile, it was like, oh, I never see this. He's so amazing. He's just like me. <laughs> he's a bigger and stronger version of me. And, and he's a weirdo like me in these areas. And I love that about him and so much potential. And when I saw him on site, I was like, damn it. Oh, nope, 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 nope. nope. And we sat down to dinner and we had this really long date. And by the end of the date, I was like, I'm not attracted to him, but I could definitely be friends with him. And he asked me out again and I kind of pushed him off and, and he was persistent. He asked me out again. I said, fine, fine, fine. And second date was okay. And then, and then I needed a date for something. And I said, do you want to go to this thing? And he jumped on it. And by the end of the third date, three in the morning, we're sitting in my car in front of a parking garage where his car was, and we just didn't want to leave each other. I'd flipped. I was, I was 100% in by date three. He was wildly attractive to me by date three. So that rarely happens. And by the way, that, that doesn't really happen for men very often ever. Right. Uh, but, that, but we have the luxury of having that happen in 10, 20% of men out there. So um, the give the man a chance, but only give him a chance if you really like him. You're just super bummed out that he's not your type, but you respect him. You think he's hilarious. You like who he is, what he's up to in the world. You have material to go the distance. That's the guy you want to give another chance to. And the very most important lesson that I ever learned on 121 first dates is I could date men who were outside of my type and, and, and fall for them. But what I could never do is I could never date a guy who was outside of my tribe. 
And what I mean by that is I might have gone on a date with someone I thought that was smoking hot and liked me and was amazing, but man, he was not in my tribe. He did not see the world the way I did in any way, shape, or form. I found it really hard for me to be seen by, you know, for who I really was or what I meant by things. If you're finding that you're working really hard at explaining who you are or making your case for what you're about, you're just not in the same tribe. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you have to, you know, match up 100% with somebody. Um, you know, you don't have to be all matchy matchy all the way across the board, but you have to have enough in common that, or enough that you see the world in the same way that you have an ease in relating to each other. You know, the chemistry will have opposites attract, but that's only to make a good baby. That has nothing to do with a, hap a happy life. Right. <laughs> Imagine politically, if you had someone completely opposite from you right now, that might be a nightmare, right? right. So, I mean, the opposites only attract from a chemical standpoint, not from a fun life together standpoint. Being mm -hmm. similar isn't boring. It's actually pretty great. Mm -hmm. So are you talking more about, I get the worldview piece, the political piece. I think what you're talking about is a lot, maybe values. You have to share some common values. Doesn't mean all your interests or hobbies have to be the same, but maybe some yeah. values. Yeah? yeah, absolutely. Common values, what you care about, what matters to you. You know, if, if you're really into saving children and they don't care about children at all, that's not going to work out for you. If you're a vet and you're working on building an animal sanctuary and he hates animals, it's not a good fit. I don't care how cute he is. We'll try and make something fit because it looks really great on paper. But when, like I said, we're working too hard just to be seen for what matters to us, it's not good. It's not good news. Yeah. So now I have another question for you. Going, I'm going for it here, Wendy. Yeah, do it. I'm going to try to make my lighting a little better, people. That the so, sun's going down. Um, this whole looks good on paper thing is a common challenge, especially for dating online. Ah. And we, you know, it, it always amazes me. I can remember back to when I was single going to this party one time, and it was a big, big, like, New Year's Eve party. It was like wall to wall bodies everywhere. And I was observing because I was kind of stuck in a corner. I couldn't move. I was kind of blocked in because of all the people there. And I was observing and watching people throughout this big, huge room. And they were like, you could tell people were like making split second decisions about each other as to whether they were even worth talking to or dancing with or anything like that. Right. Yeah. And and I was guilty of this, too. I'm not saying like everybody else was doing it and I wasn't because I was doing the same thing. But I got cornered by this guy, not in a creepy way, but just because there were so many people there that we couldn't really move. Yeah. And I kind of so I got kind of cornered by this guy and, and he was not my type at all physically. I wasn't attracted to him at all. But because we were just kind of stuck there, we started talking and he ended up being the coolest guy. I ended up going out with him and ended up having a really great time. So back to what I was saying, that was the in life, that was the life version of what I'm talking about. But so often I hear women say, well, either he looks perfect, you know, when they're talking about a profile or whatever online, or he just doesn't look at my type at, like he's my type at all, or they reject him for some tiny little thing they see. She likes a cat. He likes a dog, whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, how can you make those kind of judgments from a few pixels on the screen? So because I know you did some, uh, a significant amount of online dating and uh, some of your work has been around online dating, what do you say about that? Like, how do, we, how do we do this filtering or this screening and what did you find that worked for you? Yeah, yeah. So I did most of my dating online. It was about, I don't remember the exact number. I think it's 108 of my 121 came from online because uh, that's where I shine. <laughs> that's where you shine. <laughs> no, the truth is, is I just can't walk into a bar and like convert anybody. I don't know. I just can't. I, the in-person in thing just never really worked that great for me. So online seemed to be my only shot. And, and yeah, there's, I think that you make a really good point. And the thing that I want to caution women about is to, really be gentle with themselves and not beat themselves up over this because 
there are ebbs and flows and highs and lows in our dating lives and in our dating energy. And man, there are some times where you just can't stand another minute of not getting your way 100%. So you're only going to go out with the ones that absolutely look great on paper and fit your criteria. Mm -hmm. And then you'll get mad at yourself and think, oh, I should give more people a chance. I'm being too judgy. Be gentle with yourself. Know that sometimes you're going to be too judgy and you're going to be too, you know, you're going to be too tight about it. And then there'll be other times in your life where, man, you're just, you're happy right now. Things are going great at work. You've got a good circle of friends. Your, your patience tank is filled up. You have more capacity to be generous. And those are the moments that you might want to spread your wings a little and go outside of the comfort zone of the looking great profile. And I have a secret for you. Almost every time I did that and went on a date, it was amazing. Because men, like you don't already know this, I know you do, do not care about their photos. <laughs> and in fact, in my personal experience, when I read a profile of the creepy guy <laughs> and his and his profile was written like a writer, I'm a writer, so I love a good writer. So if I could read his profile and he could write well, mm, sexy, and he was doing something I was interested in and all the brackets fit with the height and money and all the things, all the deal. But I looked at that photo and I was not digging him. If I loved everything else and went on that date, 100% of the time, he was way cuter in real life. Hmm. Some of my very best dates, some of the ones who got away were just, I should have passed them by. And I was like, nope, I'm going to give him a chance mode today. I'm going to read Mr. Cross-Eyed, Creepy-Eyed guy's <laughs> profile. Creepy eyes. He had creepy eyes. Number 113, creepy eyes. <laughs> Fell totally in love with that guy. So, <laughs> you know, you, sometimes you got to do it. You, you see the creep factor, but then you read. Read. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what you're saying about the photos is so true. <laughs> it's just painful, some of the photos yeah. that are out there. Um, and, and, so, and, now, and, and to be clear, like if he's, I'm, I'm not talking the dude who's flexing without the shirt. That's a bad right. judgment guy, right? I'm not right. talking about that guy. I'm just, if he's showing bad judgment in the photo, that's different than just a bad photo. Okay. Right. Continue on. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's different than just kind of an out of focus, unflattering photo. That's, we're talking yeah. about two different things. Yeah, and um, I like what you said, too, about women being patient with, them, patient with themselves because I believe, you know, as women, we, you know, at one time in our lives, we have monthly cycles. If you're beyond that, I still think women are always cycling. Yeah. I think we're always kind of in an energetic flow somewhere in that cycle. And I think that, for me, was a continuing, ongoing process in dating where, you know, I would be, like you said, up for being open, free, willing to give people a chance. My patience meter was up and then other times I wasn't. Right. So I, I like the way you framed that. That's really helpful. So Wendy, I know I could talk to you all day because I love asking you questions and I love hearing your point of view. Um, Thank you. I, know. Um, I love to play with you. You're so great. Before we wrap up, any last words of wisdom or a last parting thought you want to share? Yeah, the real success. The real hot tip for dating success so you can find your love, here it is. Get started. Don't settle. Don't stop. I love it. And on that note, <laughs> ladies, we're so glad you joined us. Bye for now. Bye.